there's something to me like in in the the self sacrifice of God in Christ that's almost like a um, a short circuit in a system or or the 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 willful breaking the rules of a game right um, yeah it's certainly referenced that way in people like if you think of the chronicles of Narnia right that that that's how um, Aslan defeats the the witch right it's by yeah. break by breaking the table right and because that's not what's supposed to happen to gods right they're not supposed to die and stay dead and and so sometimes it feels to me like the resurrection is is the need for us to still play the game oh no but our god still wins right um when in reality our god won anyway right because our god <laughs> broke the right yeah game. Um, right there's no, there's nothing for us to feel insecure about in the crucifixion right? right because god proved that god was god right in the death that 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 he suffered right and yeah. I, and go ahead uh one thing i just remembered that i wanted to say a while back was um sort of where i think atonement theologies began to sort of to sort of fracture and then sort of erode over time is that we put um, we put the emphasis of atonement theology on the pain that Jesus suffered rather than the humiliation of God. Right. Right. Because, and, and death by crucifixion was extremely painful, right? Yeah. And, um, and so when you were talking earlier about how crucifixion was a curse, I think that that's the larger part of that story. Right. Right. It, it, I think that Jesus did experience pain in the crucifixion sure. and I'm not trying to undercut the pain. Right. Um, but I, I think that what's more important than the pain that Jesus suffered being sort of this storehouse of heavenly treasure for us to draw upon and cover our sins is that God let God's self be humiliated. Right. Right. On the cross. Yes. Um, existentially, right? I mean, that's the thing about the crucifixion, I think, is it wasn't just bodily, right? It wasn't just the broken body, but it was the feeling of, of abject forsakenness expressed, right? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why have you forsaken me? Right? Yeah. And, and G.K. Chesterton has this beautiful quote that I love to use is, it's in that moment that God knew what it was like to be an atheist, right? Mm. That there's this deep alienation within the very person of God um, in that moment. And that that somehow is redemptive because it was God doing it. It doesn't mean violence can be redemptive by us engaging in violence towards someone else, right? We're not talking about the Inquisition here but that because it was God's freely chosen act, that that is redemptive for us at our core. Um, and, well, yeah. and I think also, you know, we can sort of point to the fruits of, of that, right? Because it's, it's that kind of, um, nonviolent self-denial and submission um, that has changed our world, you know, in present context, right? If you think about the nonviolent abolitionist movement, sure, or, you know, the hunger strikes in India under Gandhi, which Gandhi allowed himself to be taught by Jesus, even though he wasn't, right you know, a professed, and it was intentionally not a professed Christian. Right. Even though he was probably a better Christian than most of us ever will be. Right. Yeah. He was a better disciple. Right. right? right. Um, and, and so I, I think that this sort of, that the, it was an acknowledgement that change is not made by God swooping down and waving a magic wand. Right. Right. 
change is made first sort of within ourselves mm -hmm. right and that if uh that it in you know and, th and then we have gandhi's quote about we have to be the change that we want to see right. right and so if we want a world that's nonviolent, if we want a world where people practice kindness right then we have to take that into ourselves and bear that cross. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I think then it, we still see the resistance to that. Let's just say like in our liturgies, for example, right? Um, in that, I would say the the dominant concept of God or image of God in our liturgies as a whole um, is or are images of dominance and traditional understandings of power, right? Um, that run contrary to how we saw God be the most powerful and decisive, which was on the cross. Right. And if we think about, I mean, this week, the collect for the fifth Sunday in Lent says, you know, oh God, only you can bring into, can sort of bring to heal the unruly wills and affections of sinners. Right. right? As though that that's God's purpose, that we're some gaggle of, right. of geese or sheep that God has to constant, or that, that God uses force right to bring to heal right when that's expressly not how god has revealed god's self in the scriptural witness mm -hmm. and in what we as christians say is the fullest revelation of god's identity in, which is in jesus right right i think i think that the one place sort of in our lives where we begin to see that pulled away is in the liturgies in Holy Week. Yes. Um, and so there's a line that we say, and I forget which service it's in, maybe you can help me, but it's, let us enter into contemplation upon those mighty acts, upon, you know, with which you've brought the salvation. Of the yeah, world. right. And that's kind of a, um, an intentional misnomer, mm -hmm. right? Because all those acts are, acts of mercy right right they're not traditionally they're not traditionally mighty right. right the passion of jesus christ is not an act of traditional might and power right but, but rather passion itself is to let something happen to you mm -hmm. right and that and that and that god revealed who god really was through submission right and I think that we can we can even sort of see the inability of the church to process that by not picking a name that's more suitable for Holy Week, <laughs> right? <laughs> like, like why do we call it the Sunday of the Passion, right? When it could be like the Sunday of Submission, right? Right. right. Or the Sunday of of um, of God's suffering, right? More directly named. You right. know, that we sort of couch in this old church word that is completely right. misunderstood in its modern context and are completely unwilling to actually enter into, you know, the contemplation of what is the real mighty act, right? Which is God emptying God's self of power. Well, you know, just think about like the image behind my head right now, right? Which is James Tissot's, uh, one of his pieces, um, for the crucifixion in much and much like you know in, in almost every visual representation of the crucifixion they all have loincloths on right mm -hmm. but we know from history that jesus would have died naked to further the humiliation but but it's like almost too uncomfortable for us to think about seeing the penis of jesus right and i mean you know it's funny to think about is, i'm sorry yeah no it is right it is like <laughs> i almost i'll have to make a joke with you offline okay 
Um, no, I'm, I'm going to say it right here. Um, yeah, but the but, sort of, yeah. But that Man, we, we I've we never put that together before. We can't get there. That's my, that's my own inability, right? It's like I've never conceived of the crucifixion happening to Jesus completely naked. Right. Um, because... Because we don't want our God to really have been shamed that way, right? Right. Um, and and so it's just. Oh my goodness! Yeah, that's a whole level. I'm sorry. I just I just went to like. You know, when Moses saw the the naked glory of God in the Old Testament, right? He had to wear that veil over his right. head, and it's just like. But we saw the naked glory on the cross, and it was humiliating, right? And it yeah. wasn't, yeah. Well, the in the Exodus story, Moses saw his ass, right? I mean, it, you know, his backside. But here in our story, like when we talk about it, you know, we we saw um, when the people there bore witness to the fullness of this man's body which we call the body of Christ and the body of God. 